The debate over the government's assisted dying legislation has now moved to hearings taking place at standing committees of both the House of Commons and the Senate. Last night, MPs voted 235 to 75 to send the bill to the committees where it will likely face amendments. That vote, coming after the government, used its majority to cut off the debate in the House of Commons on the bill, which provides certain adults with the right to medical help to end their lives. For more on how the government is managing the legislative process for this bill and what might be ahead for the government's proposals, I'm joined by three MPs. From the foyer of the House of Commons this evening, I'm joined by Sean Casey, the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Justice. Uh, you will also see in the foyer this evening Michael Cooper, the uh, Deputy Critic for Justice for the Official Opposition, uh, was also the co-chair of the Special Parliamentary Joint Committee on Assisted Dying, and Murray Rankin is the Justice Critic for the NDP, he was also a co-chair of the Special Joint Committee on Assisted Dying as well. Uh, it, it, of course, proposed recommendations to the government on how to respond to the Supreme Court ruling allowing medically assisted suicide in this country. Uh, Mr. Casey, let me start with you. Um, let's begin with the decision to, to impose time allocation on the debate in the House of Commons at second reading uh, last night. Mm -hmm. uh, why did the government do that uh, on such an important issue such as this? Well, we're up against a hard deadline of the 6th of June, and uh, we, need to, we need to respect that deadline and allow for the, the bill to get to the next, uh, the next step. It had been debated for extended hours uh, over, over two days, plus a Friday, so so more than two and a half days of full debate. Uh, we we actually wanted to extend the de the debate beyond midnight on Tuesday evening and presented a motion to that effect, which was defeated. Um, and uh, and by the time we got to about 11 o'clock Tuesday evening, there were some members speaking on it uh, for the second time. So it, it it was at the at the point really where it, it needed to be moved along uh, because of that June 6th date, and uh, and that's the reason why we were put in a position where we had to do that. Okay, I want to come back to the date and the significance of that for our viewers. Uh, Mr. Cooper, let me turn to you, though. What do you think Canadians lost by having the debate cut off in the House at second reading? If, as Mr. Casey says, yeah. some members were starting to speak for the second time. Well, first of all, uh, I would agree with Mr. Casey that we are up against a tight do timeline. So it is true that this debate uh, could not go on uh, for as long as perhaps it should have. Uh, that being said, I would was uh, disappointed uh, that the government moved to close debate uh, when they did. Uh, I think there was a good opportunity to allow at least another full day of debate uh, in the House. Had the government done that, that would have at least given uh, a number of MPs an opportunity uh, to speak. The government didn't do that. Uh, it was disappointing, right. and uh, but it is what it is. And now uh, we're, we're going to it's going to move to committee and. We're going to have a clause by clause review uh, starting next week. Right. Uh, Murray Rankin, let, let me ask you. Uh I mean, why was there a need for more de a debate in the House on, on this bill, if you believe that? And, and, and if, uh, because there wasn't, uh, what is it you think Canadians lost by not hearing from more MPs? Well, look, I'm more concerned about the content of the bill than I am about the lack of time for the debate. But I do think what's lost is the ability for members on such a sensitive issue to have what they say. I'm disappointed. I, I agree, however, with my colleagues. We've got to get this done. I, I'm much more concerned about the bill that it's before us. I think it's it's very problematic. Okay, uh, well, let's let's get into some of the. Uh, uh well, I, I, we've, we've covered the issues many times, the, the, the four of us on, uh, on uh, this panel, uh, about the specific issues, so our, our viewers are probably f fairly aware. I don't want to drill down too much except to talk a little bit, Mr. Casey, here about the case that you've made that uh, the legislative process needs to be pushed along because of the deadline of June 6th given by the Supreme Court to pass a new law. Uh, what if there isn't a new law on June 6th? Uh, what would happen? Well, what would happen is that the uh, sections of the criminal code that were de declared to be unconstitutional would fall off the books. Even though they were declared unconstitutional back in February of last year, um, the, their invalidity has been suspended. So they're still on the books. So they would fall off the books. Uh, the safeguards that are built into this bill, uh, the eligibility criteria that are built into this bill would, would not be in effect. And what we would be left with is 
no provisions in the criminal law and simply the Carter decision. So for example, uh, the requirement of having uh, two witnesses, the requirement of a 15-day reflection period, the requirement of having uh, two doctors uh, right. offer an opinion, all of those things would, would not be requirements if we get to June the 6th. Okay, Mr. Cooper, where, where, where are you on that? What, what about that argument that there's no new law in place June 6th, there's effectively this sort of legal vacuum. Yeah. Uh, maybe doctors would refuse to help a patient die and there would be all this uncertainty around the issue. Do you agree with that? There, there would be a, a legal vacuum and that's why I, I agree with Mr. Casey that it is important that we pass a law. Uh, I think that the legislation in a lot of ways contains many good measures. However, there are areas where I believe there uh, is room for improvement and that's why at second reading I had to make the tough choice of uh, voting for or against and I fought long and hard about it and in the end I made the decision to vote against the bill in its present form because of some of the deficiencies that I see. Uh, there is going to be an opportunity for amendments to be brought forward at committee. I hope the government entertains them and I hope that the bill can be improved. But I agree with Mr. Casey that at the end of the day on June 6, we do need a law. Uh, Murray Rankin, do you see it that way? Is it absolutely imperative that Parliament get a bill passed by June 6 in your view, especially if it's a bill that you have some serious problems with? Yeah, I mean, I think there's some good points being made. I agree that the safe guards we really want to get in place. There's some who argue that much could be done on those points at the provincial level. I remind our listeners that Quebec already has a bill to that effect. The sections of the criminal code will be no longer valid as of that date. That's all true. Many have said we could deal with this uh, vacuum, which I think is a good word, by the kind of things Ontario and other provinces are doing with their uh, regulatory bodies. So I think a lot could be done at, provincial, at the provincial level without this bill. Is it better to have a bill in place? Absolutely. I agree with that. But this bill, I'm sad to say, is causing me great concern. Okay, let's. Uh, you, you did want to drill down a little bit, so this is the opportunity for all of us to do that. M Mr. Casey, uh, in, in the context of, of what we've heard, at least uh, in, in the first few days of hearings uh, on both sides of, of Parliament, in the House and the Senate, uh, what's your sense of what, what people are saying about this bill? My sense in watching these hearings is there seem to be a lot of people concerned with, with this bill and it's it, what many have described as imperfections and suggesting amendments and that brings us to what the government might be prepared to do by way uh, of amendments on this bill. Are you open to that and what do you think of what you've been hearing? Well, let me be completely candid. We have no choice but to be open to that. Uh, the parliamentary committees are masters of their own destiny. Um, anyone at the committee can bring forward an amendment that, is, that will be voted on. Uh, and then once they're voted on, they're going to go uh, into the House of Commons at report stage, and there's going to be a free vote, and then it's going to go over to the Senate where there is no party discipline. Right. So, so my short I mean, answer is... Is it fair to suggest that you know it's, it's a different uh, ball of wax here at the House Committee than it is at the Senate Committee because uh, the Liberals have the, the majority on the, on the House Committee? In which case you could vote down amendments at the House Committee where they might have a better chance of coming forward from the Senate. Is that fair enough? Uh, not necessarily. Okay. Not necessarily. Uh, this is a new day. Stephen Harper is no longer the Prime Minister and committees are no longer a branch plant of the PMO. Uh, and that's that's the reason why parliamentary secretaries like myself are there in an observer capacity right. only and not uh, writing scripts for the others to read. Okay, M M Mr. Cooper, do you expect uh, this bill will be amended when it comes out of either that uh, the House House Committee or the the Senate Committee? Well, uh, I guess I can't answer that. Mr. Casey may be able to answer that, but certainly I think the bill does need to be amended. It certainly needs to be amended uh, if it's going to garner my support. In, in which uh, key area for you? Well, the, the biggest key area is conscience protections. Okay. I think it is important that Parliament legislate on conscience protections. Uh, we do see inconsistencies in terms of some of the uh, guidelines that are coming out uh, of the colleges. I think that uh, a provision within the uh, federal uh, um, uh, legislation would go a long way to clarifying that to ensure that everyone's charter rights are protected. Uh, as far as the bill overall, I think um, it's less about what is in the bill than what is left out of the bill, and one of the areas that is left out of the bill is conscience protection. So that would be a key uh, condition to okay. garnering my support. Mr. Rankin, um, am I fair to assume while Mr. Cooper may see it as, as not 
not restrictive enough. You see uh, some of the measures well, this bill is too restrictive? Actually, that's not how okay. I see it. What I see it as is unconstitutional. I see it as not being consistent with the, what the Supreme Court said unanimously in a case called Carter. Mm. People who are seriously disabled but aren't coming to the end of life do not have the protection that they unanimously receive from the Supreme Court uh, uh, when the Carter case was decided. We've heard that it's unconstitutional from one of Canada's leading constitutional lawyers, professors and the like. I'm deeply troubled that we would, as lawyers on the com Justice Committee, pass a bill which is, in my judgment and that of many others, simply unconstitutional. I'll join with my colleague, Mr. Cooper, to provide conscience protection to the extent we can, but that's the bottom line. It has to comply with the Supreme Court of Canada or we're right back there again. And so how confident are you that the kinds of things you think need to be uh, changed about the bill will be changed at the end of the day? I continue to believe that people of goodwill will work together and, and look at the evidence, the constitutional law evidence before them and act accordingly. That's certainly how I see it. All right, gentlemen, uh, as always, I appreciate your time. Uh, you've been uh, uh, ready and willing to discuss these important issues whenever we've asked you. And uh, I suspect we'll ask again in, in the weeks ahead. But thanks for your time tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. And we'll have more on the assisted dying.